Welcome, Lucinda, and thank you for inviting us here today. And I am going to give you all a general overview of what natural language processing is before Tommaso takes us through his really, really interesting um, project that he did on using natural mixed methods in natural language processing. That's very topical with International Women's Week being next week. Um, so any of you who are coming here uh, from the school of tech or from an equally data background, some of this will probably sound quite familiar to you, but hopefully I'll give you some new info on uh, language itself. Now, if anybody's coming from a linguistics background, please don't call me out on my lack of very deep language knowledge. Um, so it's a little bit of an intro on both sides. So um, if you've got questions, as Lucinda said, please do pop them in the chat um, and we will yeah, you know, we'll we'll have plenty of time for questions and discussion at the end, and lots and lots of time for can I do this with natural language processing? The answer is almost always yes. So today I'm going to start you off talking you to you about the human language, okay? Because understanding how computers see language, we first have to really understand humans, and we'll talk about the difference between humans and computers, and how do we teach computers about humans, okay, and how they, we can get them to do what we want them to do with natural language processing, okay, and then like I said, I'm going to hand over to Tommaso, after that point, he's going to take us through his really interesting study, um, not that I'm biased, and I definitely wasn't his supervisor or anything, um, and then Luc we're going to bring Lucinda back, because uh, Lucinda and I are currently working on a really interesting project, so we're going to talk about what we've got coming up as well. So, what is language? Okay, you can ask yourself this as well. What, what is language to you? So typically when we talk about language, we're talking about a method of communication. My primary language is English. I know English and I know bad English and I can say hello in a few different languages, but really nothing meaningful. Okay, um, so today when I'm talking about language, I'm the examples that I'm gonna use are gonna be English, British English language examples. OK, um, but the things that I'm talking about work in all languages and have been advanced across lots of different languages, especially recently. Now, humans do primarily use spoken language, but we also use um, gestures. Sign language is established several different types of sign language. We use body language. We use tone and we use all those kinds of things. OK, computers speak in ones and zeros. That's called binary ones and zeros, they make up bits and bytes and nibbles. You may have heard that terabytes. OK, but essentially computers only speak ones and zeros. Everything else above that that we get them to do is interpretations that are models that are built on top of that programs that are built on top of that. So you being able to see me on your screen really boils down to a series of ones and zeros and what we make those ones and zeros do. So right from the get go, we know that human beings are capable of an awful lot more than computers. But now we see things like ChatGPT, we see these the new advance in ChatGPT of the generative AI videos you may have seen. OK, um, but all of that process is down to getting computers to behave like humans. So to get them to behave like humans, we need to understand humans and how humans work. So we're going to talk about words. All right, this is probably bringing you all back to your GCSE English. And I know we've got some um, mixed disciplines and there are an awful lot more to words than what I'm showing you on the screen. But we're probably all familiar with verbs and nouns and adjectives. OK, we talk about our adverbs quickly back ever. OK, prepositions, pronouns, me, you, she, he. OK, interjections. All right, so these little, sometimes we call them stop words if we're talking computers. So we know we have all of these words and we can break the words down into the types of word, right? And this is important because we need to tell the computer what type of word this is, okay? We can talk about bits of words. These are called stems. I'll give you an example, victory, factory, and victorious. Now, victory and factory, if you look at them, Straight up, they are actually more similar than victory and victorious. But we know in the human language, victory and victorious are more meaningfully related than victory and factory. Okay, so what we do, okay, is we look, we have something called a word stem. Okay, so that is the core part of the word that is meaningful. All right, so that means in this case we would take the V I C T. 
of the word, the vict, the fact, those are the stems of the word. So we've got the type of word and we've then got the part of the word. Okay, so type of the word and then we've got the part of the word. And these are all meaningful things. These are not things that you think about when you're having a conversation with your friend down the pub. But it's all part of the complexity of language. So we can think about what words mean things in communication. So we've got these stop words, as we call them stop words in computing. And we've got a different word in linguistics. But these words are absolutely essential for a sentence to make sense. If, and, but, the, of, so. However, you take them out and the sentence can make sense to a computer. So it's nothing to do with the subject of the sentence, but really important when it comes to the understanding of the sentence. So the cow jumped over the moon. Cow jumped moon. We don't speak like that um, when we're speaking out loud in human language. Cow jumped moon. We say the cow jumped over the moon. But if you were to read a passage from a book and you did a word cloud, we love word clouds, don't we? I love word clouds. The word the of if. If? If is not a word. I just made that up. Anyway, if and but the of. That's those. If you count the number of those instances inside of a book, that's going to rapidly be your biggest letters on your word cloud. But really, if you're wanting to digest a book, you want to know about the cow jumping over the moon. OK, you want to see how many times the cow is mentioned, the moon is mentioned. So we get rid of these words which are essential for the humans to understand, but actually are not the core of what it is that we're wanting to say. OK, so we get, those are the stop words. Now, this is one of my favorite things about languages, is there's actually distances between words. This is something called hyponymy and hypernomy. And it is nothing to do with hippos, which does make me slightly sad. But we can map the entire dictionary and we can map the distance between words in the dictionary. So if we take our example that we've got on the screen, we've got color, right? So we've got color. Now underneath color, we've got purple, we've got blue. Underneath purple, we've got violet, we've got lavender. Underneath blue, we've got navy. So these positions that words sit in with each other actually have distances that we can put on them. So we know that violet and lavender are more closely related than lavender and navy because we measure the distance along these lines. Okay, so lavender goes up to purple. You find that common ancestor. So just as you have the genetic difference, distance, sorry, genetic distance between a human being and a gorilla, by going to our common ancestor, or a horse and a zebra by going to their common ancestor, words have that same ancestry. Okay, so they have that same commonality, which means that when you are sorting words, you can actually say, right, well, the, the word violet is more closely related to lavender, but how far is the word violet from the word tree? Okay. So we can we've mapped the dictionary. In fact, I worked with a person who classified the entire dictionary. OK, um, very, very cool project done by the Oxford University Press. But other dictionary, other universities and places have mapped different dictionaries because the British dictionary is different from the American dictionary. And then, of course, we have different language dictionaries as well. I've now said the word dictionary too many times and it's become meaningless. All right. So we've got types of words and nouns adjective verbs we've got parts of words we've got the stems we've got words which mean something but also don't mean something we've got words in relation to words and then we have sentences okay so we've built up our sentences All right so we've got our noun phrase the cat we've got our verb phrase plays piano and these are in specific orders because what does the cat do the cat plays the piano what happens to the cat so what happens to the piano? The cat plays. That sounds a bit weird. OK, so although it's kind of technically correct, something is happening to the piano, but because the piano is in the verb phrase, we swap it out. So this is just a real quick whirlwind introduction to the complexities of language. Now, try teaching that to a computer. OK, so we've got to know it and understand it ourselves, because if we don't, then it doesn't really translate over to the computer. Because remember, we've got words, sentences, inflection, 
gesture, computers have got ones and zeros. OK, so the cat plays the piano. Right? It's meaningful. Each one of those words plays a role and its position in the sentence plays a role. And we haven't even got to conversations yet. OK. Ooh, and then we go aside going forward. All right. We've even got these nuances of the adjective order. So in English, it's an inherent thing that you say the adjectives in a certain order. So quantity, quality, size, age, shape, color. Now, until I saw this tweet that was on the screen, I didn't even realize I did that. OK, but the strange green metallic material is how we would do that. OK, so it even dictates where you put an and or a comma. OK, and again, all of this is meaningful. OK, it's specific and it's deliberate of the way the language is used and developed. OK, we love seeing people on the Internet call out, oh, you use then rather than than. Um, and actually, those sorts of things, generally, we do understand what people are going for. OK, so um, but you will see people get really finickety about the way that certain types of languages are used because, you know, um, eating with your children and your dogs or eating your children and your dogs and, and things like that. There's lots of and lots of examples about misuse, which changes the inflections, which changes the purpose. And next thing you know, you've accidentally cooked your grandma. OK, um, but all that is to say it's important, but it's really specific and really nuanced and can be very difficult to explain, let alone write rules, let alone translate it into ones and zeros. Okay. So how do we communicate with computers? We use programming languages. Okay, so we use programming languages to communicate with computers. All right. So computers will do exactly what you tell them to do. Okay. So we will turn human language into computer language. OK, so we will say to the computer, print hello world and the computer will do exactly that. You will give it a series of commands. They're wonderful. Do exactly what you say. And they're terrible because they will do exactly what you say. OK, so. Printing that hello world. Now, the computer will turn that into these ones and zeros, OK, which is fine, but it's not especially useful. So we need to build that up. OK, so. We need to turn that into a series of commands. That means it can in interpret human language. So we need to teach the computer. OK, so we teach the computer in a few different ways. We can give it supervised learning. Right. So this is machine learning. You can split it into three particular ways. Supervising machine learning. This is where we say, right, here's all the right answer. Find out why. We say unsupervised learning. Well, here's a whole bunch of information. Figure it out for me. Tell me where it splits. And then we do reinforcement learning. OK, so we, we tell it when it's doing right and we give it a score. So fraud detection, customer seg segmentation, chat GPT are examples of all the different ways that we use this machine learning. OK, so where we have data sets, big old data sets, historic data sets, we can feed that to the computer. It works out the rules and then it says this is likely to be this case. Or we can say, well, we don't really know what we want the outcome for this to be, but tell me who is similar to who. That's how we can look at customer segmentation. And we can say, right, have a go at predicting this. I'm going to tell you how well you do. Then you go ahead and you learn from that. All right. So that is how machine learns. And that's, that's it. Machine learning 101. You're done. You're good to go. OK, um, that's obviously a very simplistic approach to it, but that is how it all boils down. So quick history then of natural language processing. So natural language processing is the computer processing of human languages. OK, it, the, a lot of interest began in World War Two, looking at translation models. So looking at um, different language translation models being done by machinery rather than by humans and the early models and challenges, you know, done by maybe you've heard of Noam Chomsky. OK. We began to realize that actually it's not just as simple as translating an English word into a French word or a German word or a Chinese word or any other language because you need to look at the wider structure of the sentence. Okay, we need to look at how things are phrased together. Okay, um, and that really led us into what's called an AI winter. So 
AI goes through hype cycles, just like lots of other things. And the first sort of AI winter where everyone kind of put it aside was in the 60s. Because one of the issues really is when we deal with these natural language processes, they're very, very complex, which means that we need really powerful computers to be able to deal with it. OK, um, our very sort of first AI conversation was called Eliza. Um, so Eliza was built in the late 60s and mimicked a essentially a, a therapist client interaction um, and essentially just structured questions. OK, and it, you know, it worked. It was obviously very basic. And anyone who's chat GBT realized actually it's, um, you know, nowhere on what that can achieve. Now, in the 80s and 90s, the statistical models and the neural networks began to get developed. OK, so these neural networks are essentially fancy predictive text. But what we can do with these is something called encoding and decoding. OK, so I've got a picture of that on the screen, right? which means that we can actually create the context from the words when they get encoded, what, so that when they get decoded, that context can remain with the word as the word changes to rearrange it in the right way. OK, so our models in the 50s and 60s could say, you know, la rosa casa from the red house when actually in Spanish it's la casa rosa. OK, so that the relativity when we talk about these great big nets of words, these mapped dictionaries can stay with the word, making that translation even better. Then, of course, we need to train our models. So when we're doing these learning algorithms, we need to feed it data to learn from. And the computing power that goes behind our chat GPTs has increased substantially. So chat GPT went from, excuse me, being trained on 117 million to 175 billion training parameters between 2018 and 2023. So in the space of five years, that's hugely, hugely improved. And that is only capable when working with really advanced computing power. So the, you know, if you remember your little desktop system, or even those old Apple computers with the green see-through backs on them, there is no way that they could cope with what even your phone does now, let alone what some of the cloud computing power has we can do. So when we actually get into building these models, OK, it always starts the same. First thing you do is you clean your data. Right? So you get rid of your funny characters, you get rid of your emojis, you get rid of your misspelled words, and mistranslated words, clean them up, make them all neat, neat and tidy. That's always going to be the part that takes the longest. So you can ingest your data in any format. You can get PDFs, you can get Word documents, you can get Twitter, you can get Reddit, you can get whatever you like. There's always a way to get that in. But then cleaning it up. All right, so even your beautiful translators, if your accent's a little bit not placeable like mine, then it will struggle to pick up some words. But you clean up your data, you've got your nice neat data, it's there, it's ready to go. You need to build a corpus. Okay, so the corpus is which which words are you gonna learn from? Now lots of our programs have got built-in corpuses, okay, or corpi, I don't know what the plural of that is, but you can say, right, here is a whole heap pile of words, train yourself on that. Next thing we do is we lemmatize our words. So we change our words into their stems. So we talked about the stems, but get, get the meaningful part of the words. And that what that means is that it prevents flooding these models with words which are actually all the same, but used slightly differently, because then your model's going to think, oh, this one's super important. And you'll get a model that is focused just on iterations of the word change. We get rid of our stop words, if and of the but. So again, we're boiling our words down to the most basic parts of it, OK? And that means that we are focusing on the really important parts of the words that we've been given. Then we build our models. OK, so some of the most popular models that are used in natural language processing, so your reinforcement learning algorithms, well done, computer, 10 out of 10 for this one, that's your chat GPT. So chat GPT is based on the same ones that learn how to play chess, okay? So it, essentially you reward the computer when it does something right. The more you do it, the more you train it on, the better it gets at predicting, okay? So it's, it's like a very enthusiastic puppy, okay? So you train it, you give it treats, you tell it what's done well, and then it will do everything you want. I clearly have not trained my dog all, all that well. 
sentiment analysis is very cool. OK, and Tommaso is going to tell you a lot more about sentiment analysis and topic modeling. But Nike used sentiment analysis to monitor public opinion when it sponsored the footballer um, Colin Kaepernick. So Colin Kaepernick is the one who very famously took the knee during the national anthem. And Nike used sentiment analysis, which will tell you if someone is saying something happy, neutral or sad. OK, and then and is really commonly used to sort of monitor customers um, and customer opinion about products and feelings. Topic modeling. Topic modeling doesn't often get into the public domain, but from a researcher perspective, it's really valuable. So topic modeling showed us that in an analysis of news articles about coronavirus, things like the markets, company drama and cancelled events were written about much more frequently than the health impacts of the disease. Okay, And um, you can take from that what you will, but that, that analyzed 35,000 news articles. OK, so thematic analysis, very, very cool. Topic modeling is essentially thematic analysis on a crazy scale. Within thematic analysis, OK, with the most common model that we use is called latent derelict allocation. So what this does is you take all your documents. So your document might be a tweet. It might be a book. It might be an interview. It might be a single line response. And it feeds it this extra layer. OK, so it takes all of these words and says, right, these words actually feature in these topics. OK, so that is how that you know, the news story allocation um, analysis picks things out. So it will look across all of these documents and find the common topics discussed in all of them. Okay. And Tommaso is now going to talk to you all about how he's actually used sentiment analysis um, and topic modeling together for the project that he did. So Tommaso, I'm going to keep driving for you, but I'll switch my mic and my camera off. Perfect. Thank you. I just do your next slide, please, as and when. Uh, so yes, thank you, everyone. So I'll introduce myself because I, I guess I've been fairly silently lurking in the background. My name is Tommaso and I also work at BP University. And yes, I uh, completed a project, I say recently, it's actually a fairly long time ago now, it feels like it, um, on natural language processing and more specifically um, how we can use the techniques that Sam has just talked us through to detect gender bias or to test whether there is gender bias in place. So this um, ultimately led me to a couple of key, I guess, objectives, key uh, hypotheses to test for this project. And one of them was to check whether there is a significant difference in the sentiment and the semantic composition of um, Twitter data. And at the time, it was still called Twitter. So this was just before it rebranded to X. So I will continue to call it Twitter because I don't think my brain can handle that at this point. Um, and then the second objective of the study was to check whether essentially we could create a tool that we could lift and shift and adapt to different kinds of media, different kinds of uses and subjects and see if it um, could provide this same sort of analysis um, for other purposes. So that's, that's the basis of my project. So Sam, next slide, please. Oh yeah, I've got fancy things in there. So yeah, to, to start us off, I will go through some of the stats I found in research in this topic. So I particularly I started off working in the tech school, looking at the technology sector. And at the time of um, writing this so a few years ago now, when I first started doing this research, um, a couple of listing studies found that about a third um, of UK and US jobs in technology um, were occupied by women, as opposed to uh, often was over 70 percent, in fact, occupied by men. Um, there's a real uh, trend um, or rather an inverse trend in importance or I guess um, value given to an academic research paper and the list or the place of any female authors uh, in the list of authors for that whole paper. So um, basically what I mean by that is that the more likely and more prestigious the the more likely to be, I guess, valued and the more prestigious the publication, the further down the list of authors, you will more likely to see um, females, female names. Um, 
additional analysis found that um, agentic descriptors, so those are things that we use to describe people who have a real drive to take the lead, take control, and you know get us out of the sticky situations, people who are born leaders. Um, there was a real, I guess, absence um, or real discrepancy between the genders. So that was those descriptors, those adjectives that we associate with that, um, with those agentic descriptors, were way more likely to be used for males. Um, very similarly, in news topics, um, we see continuous um, validation of these gender stereotypes um, in the term in terms of the um, the, the I guess the, the spheres of topics that they they talk about so in 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 this case it was um, I don't it was identified that women or articles focusing on women tended to cover on what the authors described as the private sphere so themes of family home and relationships and that was a, across a number of different um, outlets and lastly and then more relevant to the rest of my study was social media and it was found that um, female social media users in um, I guess high visibility roles so in these cases it was politicians were more frequently subjected to challenges on their professionalism and have their credibility disputed publicly um, and I think in both cases, I started, it was on Twitter, so everyone was able to see that. So next slide, please. Um, and that essentially um, gave me the idea of what to, to, to look into. So um, I'm a sports fan, I like all kinds of sports, and at the time I thought I'd choose tennis. And I essentially found 10 famous tennis players, very famous tennis players, all with active Twitter accounts and a large following base and uh, using the Twitter um, API extracted the, uh, the tweets in which they were directly tagged um, so in which they were addressed over a two-week period I collected hundreds and hundreds of tweets over that period and that formed my um, my big data set that's what um, I ended up testing so next slide and these are the two techniques um, that essentially helped me to analyze this information. So um, as I mentioned, sentiment analysis and topic modeling. So there are lots of different algorithms, different programs available to carry out sentiment analysis. One of them is this rather cool named one called uh, VEDA. And it's to reiterate what Sam said, it, it essentially looks at a body of text and it tells me whether it's a positive text, negative or Kind of both maybe neither so it takes in those important words and looks at whether those words ultimately formulate a positive um, message within that contained tweet and then afterwards carried out topic modeling which is essentially to look at what the people who were addressing these tennis players were talking about what were they saying exactly um, when they were addressing um, these users that we studied. So here I mentioned a program that um, essentially developed to, to try and test. Here it is summarized. Um, you know, we, we start with the API, we collect all these tweets, we have this nice database. Crucially, then there was a lot of cleaning to do. Um, yes, there are lots of emojis, images, um, there are lots of um, hyperlinks and lots of, frankly, for this purpose, useless things in there. So removed all of those. And then if you can kind of gush your memory back to, uh, back to the lemmatization and the stemming, carried out all of that to essentially create slightly different data sets or rather divided data sets based on um, the gender of the users, which we then analyzed. So that's the program ultimately as a whole. Um, so next slide, please. So what did I find? So you can see this chart uh, in a way summarizes the sentiment scores fairly, fairly well. You can see that really visibly there isn't a huge amount of difference. Um, what's quite nice to see is that you can, there's a lot of, uh, there are a lot more positive tweets being um, sent to these tennis players than there are negative um, and then followed by the neutral. So, that was um, 
always that's always lovely to see so um i then carried out a couple of statistical tests to see whether there really was any significant difference and there was between uh, i guess across the sets so as you can see that there are significantly more positive tweets and neutral tweets than there are negative so um there is a tendency for twitter users to reach out to these tennis players with positive or neutral messages rather than negative. However, as you probably deduced, there was really a significant difference um, in the actual distribution between the genders. It's more or less the same. Nonetheless, I wanted to investigate that a little bit further because a difference is worth looking into. Um, so next slide, please, Sam. I looked at it into uh, a little bit more detail. And as you can see, the proportion of um, negative tweets that the te female tennis players received was higher by about 3% um, between, between the, um, over, higher than the male tennis players. So not a huge difference, um, but a difference nonetheless. And in an ideal world, we wouldn't see any. Um, so the way that these sentiment analysis algorithms work is that they have a sort of thresholds. So they'll allocate a score to the, the text that um, you've provided. And based on that score, it will be categorized into a positive, negative, or neutral. Um, what I did to maybe be a little bit stricter, I carried out some post tuning, which essentially means making those ranges a little bit smaller so being a bit stricter in the category in the categorization so if there was a score that was only just neutral only just negative i'd remove it from consideration just to look at um the more extreme cases and the difference remained this more or less the same still two percent so fairly small but there was something there so clearly there's a there's a difference there worth looking into so the next step was to look at what exactly people were saying. And this is where the topic modeling comes in. So on the next slide, you can see here an example of the sort of dashboard that um, you're presented when you carry out this topic modeling technique, this LDA analysis. And you can see lots of circles there on the chart. Um, and that is very useful to tell you how many distinct topics the model essentially identifies. You can see there's one on the top right, one on the bottom left, and then a whole bunch on the bottom right. So that tells us there are probably three distinct topics um, being identified by the model in that particular case there. So in the next slide, we can see the differences between the gender data sets. So on the left, we've got the negative data sets. We can see that um, there are more that there are more negative tweets being um, addressed to female tennis players in general, but we can also see proportionally there are more uh, negative tweets that mention that are, well categorized as aggressive language. So in some cases it was really quite abusive language that wasn't identified in the case of male tennis players. We can see that negative tweets um, also addressed the tennis players' physical attributes. And um, in line with some of the research I pointed to earlier, um, mentioned topics to do with what I categorized here as family. Um, and we can see a similar trend in the positive sentiment data set. Interestingly, there are, um, the, this, uh, there are fewer um, aggressive tweets being addressed to female tennis players. So generally that tells us that when Twitter users are addressing these um, tennis players positively, there's, as we can imagine, no aggressive language. But the difference the, in physical attributes and more specifically the family themes increase. So we can see there's a tendency there for Twitter users, X users, to engage with these tennis players. And depending on the, whether the tennis player is male or female to not necessarily alter the language, but perhaps they're more ready to address them regarding certain topics than the word the other gender. And those are essentially the findings here. And I think on the next slide, we have just a bit of a summary really. So yes, we can create a tool. We can 
create a program um, and you know I did this fairly easily by collating uh, publicly available algorithms encoding um, on the internet so it's relatively straightforward to do to then feed it these this information feed it these text data and analyze the sentiment and the topics to to gain some really valuable insights really interesting insights and sometimes quite hard hitting insights um, the LDA models uh, allude to greater consistency of negative language. Um, we could see that there was just the, the proportion high for pretty much every category there. And it also shows us that there is a significant disparity. So all these were sort of statistically tested and I found that there was a significant disparity in the themes, in the choice of words used by Twitter users to address each gender. And this in turn gives us some fairly clear applications for for future research it, it you know the first place to start is by expanding the sample period as i mentioned this was only two weeks only 10 tennis players maybe we need, this needs to be expanded over the course of a year to 10 however much we can we can wait basically and increase the the population size let's look at more tennis players from there there's continuous improvement that can be made to the model you know that the the program that I created was now, two, I think about two years ago, maybe a year and a half ago or so. So no doubt improvements have been made to the algorithms that um, I used at the time, or there might be new um, ways to analyze the data available out there that I didn't available at the time. So this can continue to progress in line with um, developments in this kind of area of technology. And of course, the whole idea is that this tool then gets lifted and shifted, as I mentioned earlier, to be applied to different types of media, different subjects, different themes to gain this really useful insight. This could be used to look at um, academic papers. It could be looking to further explore the, um, the type of behavior that uh, the politicians are subjected to, uh, which is particularly pertinent this year, which I think is the the record number of democratic elections going on at any one time in the world. So you can imagine there's all that information out there that we could really study. And then you've got things like marketing material, very similar to what Sam mentioned earlier. So possibilities are numerous and it's a very interesting and potentially exciting sphere to, to work in. So I hope that was interesting. Um, we'll just stop to a bit of the project. I, I hope everyone enjoyed that. So, any questions, just pop them in the chat. Thanks, Sam. Thanks, Tomasa. That was really interesting. Like I said, I'm not biased or anything. But um, so um, we have had some questions in the chat. And so what I'll do is I'll just finish up this little bit, I'll answer the questions, and then I will bring uh, Lucinda in. Because the question was about whether or not you can do these things in chat GPT and Manish has just tried it on an article in chat GPT so you can and there are capabilities you can also use the chat GPT API um, so you, you can use them the difficulty comes with chat GPT being a bit of a black box um, getting the statistical validity out of them there's also a couple of complicating factors which is chat GPT is public cloud so unless you have a privately hosted instance of ChatGPT, you're really limited on what you can ethically serve it. Because anything that you give it, it remembers and it uses it to train its model, uh, particularly on that reinforcement thing as well. And also it depends on whether you've got the premium, the API. So that's the application programming interface. It's how you kind of hit the back end of the data with things. So absolutely doable, but it's probably going to cost you money in programmers. So um, Tommaso and I, both built our programs inside of Python, which is free to use, which big fan of, you know, they say if it's free, it's for me. Um, so definitely you can use it, but use it with caution and it might not be quite as versatile as you hope when you're starting to get into large volumes of things. So ChatGPT itself as well is trained on Reddit. OK, now I, d I love a, a rabbit, Reddit rabbit hole as much as the next person, but with reddit okay so reddit is a primarily american um american user base uh it's also it does have moderators but it does have some some sort of dark areas and a lot of um that can influence the way these algorithms behave okay so computers model humans and humans are most certainly not perfect 
Okay, so um, Google has just released a, a challenger to ChatGPT trained on all of its own data rather than just Reddit. Um, so whether that is better or worse or is yet to be seen, but it doesn't take very long to prompt these algorithms into being quite unsavory, um, which I think is probably the most polite way I can think to describe it on a recorded call. So what these, are, these models is really only as good as the data that you feed them. And it does mean that cultures and dialects are not equally represented. OK, so you do need to use them. And there is obviously a great need for a sarcasm font. OK, so some of the more advanced models can be induced to pick up on sarcasm, but they're not perfect. So there is, of course, a risk that, especially with sentiment analysis, that you are misclassifying something um, as excellent or happy um, when in reality it's actually sarcasm. Okay, so just as the difficulty is we get understanding tone and inflection when we're reading text data, that computer is going to have exactly those same issues. Um, so is there any validation done around whether humans agree the sentiments are uh, positive, negative and neutral? So the way that those models are built is on supervised learning. So what we do is we split it into what's called a test and train set. So typically you'll have, say, 10,000 um, human classified tweets. So usually some poor postgraduate student um, has had to sit there and go through manually and say, this is happy, this is neutral, this is sad. Happy, neutral, sad, happy, neutral, sad. OK, and we then get some new, we get those 10,000 and we train the model on some of it. And then we test it on the rest. So we don't train it on everything, otherwise it's going to be a perfect fit. And so what we're looking for there is to see, is there enough consistent variation in the data to be able to say this is going to happen again? The Google car was um, done on supervised learning. They drove it around the desert for hours and hours, actually days, weeks, months um, for the uh, Google car. So yeah, there's, there is validation. And then what we do, of course, is then backwards validation and we get a statistical certainty for how confident we are that we got most of these right. So when Tommaso was talking about that threshold, so Tommaso challenged his model to be more precise. So you can actually get this, you can say, I have this room for error. And you can even say, I have room for types of error. So when it comes to fraud, for instance, again, that's supervised learning. What we often find is that our you know, clients, customers, the users of people for these algorithms with fraud, they would rather let fraud go than accidentally accuse their customers of fraud. So you have your sort of false positives, false negatives, um, true positives, true negatives. And in some cases, you can change that tolerance for actually, I would rather have a model that errs towards um, the false negatives than the false positives. But we can talk about that all day. So now I'm going to tell you a little bit about what Lucinda and I have got planned. So Lucinda, can I invite you back? Absolutely. I was just having a bit of a, a lag there um, in my uh, internet. So um, I started doing a completely separate project. I hadn't even met Sam when I was doing this project. Um, and I was looking at um, legal apprentices' feelings around and experiences of academic failure or what they saw as academic failure. Um, and it was a qualitative study, so I ended up with um, nine long interviews about how they feel um, about this. and. As they'd given their permission, um, I met Sam and I said, oh, I wonder if we ran this through your program, if it would come, pull out the same themes and come to the same conclusions that I did. So currently what Sam and I are doing is um, looking at whether the computer um, method um, comes um, I'll, I'll bob my email in the chat in a minute, uh, Ingo, um, whether the computer method comes to the same conclusions that I 
with a human brain did. And then we're going to get some other human brains involved as well, um, both from the School of Law where I am and the School of Tech where Sam is, uh, and see what sort of consensus we get um, from people. So the idea is to see how close it is and whether or not we could then look at creating um, a, a, a model, a method of computer assisted qualitative analysis because as anybody who's been involved in qualitative analysis knows it takes forever and a day um, to go through everything and do the themes so that's what we are currently working on Sam I don't know if you want to add anything to that so the really cool part about this study um, is that usually topic modeling and things like that they are done on a big big scale so we all know when you increase your sample size your chances of getting something significant also increase just because you get more versions of what is common so what we're really looking for is to see whether or not this can be used on a smaller scale study um, where you wouldn't necessarily have the investment to you know buy a nice tool or a premium subscription you don't want to be using public cloud platforms um, but also you want to be able to run it quickly and so these kinds of things are really useful in um, you know survey responses and, and stuff like that so any of your open responses so what we're doing really is just checking to see like I think it was um, it was Helen wasn't it who said has it been tested against um, human outputs is to see whether or not it works in this case so we're pretty confident they work well on a large scale but can it cope with the small scale interviews um, and not get flooded by the interview themes as well so we just check and see how sensitive is it um, but yeah so now it's my turn to thank you all for being a wonderful audience um, I've really enjoyed your questions and has anybody got any more so if you want to use it so you, I could certainly send you a version um, of the Python program and if I can show you how to use it as well and um, so you'll just need access to Python I use mine through Google Colabs um, now if you do want to use the Twitter API I will warn you the Twitter API changes like every other week and you'll need to get yourself set up as a developer on the Twitter API but certainly for the you know we can share our well, I'll speak for myself. I'm happy to share my topic modeling um, program um, or I'm happy to collaborate as well if you need a programmer to help you with it. <laughs> yeah, I've got I'm always looking happy to be a in the background collaborator, but I've also got lots of other colleagues as well in the school attack who um, know more about programming than I do as well. Do we have any other questions for Sam and Damaso? No. I think I think that just leaves me to uh, again say thank you ever so much um, to both our presenters for coming along and talking about this. Um, I put my email in the chat so anybody who wants to get in touch um, with us either um, for ALT South reasons and I will add that we are always looking for people to um, come along and join in um, on the committee as well um, at ALT South um, or anybody who wants to get in touch with Sam uh, and or Tommaso I can put you in touch with them as well um, and thank you very much all for attending thank you so much for having us I've really enjoyed that thank you very much thank you great I will call a halt thank you